I remember my mum telling the story of when I was in my mother's womb and my nanny would have put her hand on her belly and told her the story of Tawera, who he would be, what he would become, and everything that she told my mum has come true to this day. Wow. Yeah, so when you think about that and the things that I'm doing now uh, are exactly what she'd said. In 1999, he helped lead a young Melbourne Storm team to the NRL Championship. And of course, as we know, life hasn't been easy for Tawera Nico. With personal and family tragedy, he's gone on to become a leader for his people, a pathway preordained by his tupuna and matua of Waikato. He is, of course, an inspiration and a leader. This is today's episode of Indigenous 100, and here he is with his story, Tawera Nico. Tawera Nico, tēnā koe. Tēnā Welcome. Koe, Welcome to Indigenous 100. Real pleasure to be here. It's awesome to have you here. I wanted to start, actually, if I could, by going back to 1999, NRL Grand Final. St George versus the Melbourne Storm. I think it's only the second year of the Melbourne Storm's existence. You signed in 1998. But in 1999, you made the grand final. St. George had already beaten you twice that year. And many thought you were lucky actually to make the final. You only just beat the Bulldogs, beat the Eels, who were favoured to make the final. You make the final. You're seen to be a stalwart of the club. An enforcer is actually what they're referring to you as in the club, even though there are people like Glenn Lazarus and the like. Five minutes before you go out on the pitch, what are you thinking, doing, and saying to yourself before that NRL grand final? Yeah, you probably have to go back a year before that actually happened, uh, Julian, and um, in 1998, as you said, we were part of the Melbourne Storm, a new franchise into the NRL. We got to the finals and uh, in 1998, in our first year, you know, um, no team's ever done that in the NRL history. And part of that leadership group was uh, Glenn Lazarus, who was our captain, myself as the vice captain. And we got to the finals, we got to the elimination uh, semi final with Brisbane in 1998. And I remember Lazo didn't play, he was injured, so I captained the side that day uh, in that finals game against the Broncos in 1998. So we got smashed by the Broncos in that game uh, a year earlier. And I remember coming off the field after the match and, and everyone was really happy, you know, our first year we'd made the finals. But if we would have beaten Brisbane that game, we would have been straight to the grand final in the first year. So walking off the field the previous year, there was this um, this feeling of you know not being satisfied. There was this real gut wrenching feeling for me because you know when you play in the NRL and you get to the finals, you don't get that many opportunities. And I remember that was my driving force for the following season in 1999. Uh, fast forward, you know, we we weren't predicted. We we lost to St. George twice that year, as you said, Julian. We got beaten comprehensively because they had the likes of Anthony Mundine, mm-hmm. Nathan Blacklock, Jamie Ainsco. These guys were just super fast and they were probably the form team in 1999. Uh, Cronulla won the minor premiership, I think, and they got bundled out. St. George beat them in the elimination final. Uh, and then we played the Bulldogs and the Parramatta Eels who were favoured to go to the final in that year and we beat both those teams from coming from behind in both those games. So for us at the Storm, we had a lot of confidence um, in terms of that. But um, sitting in the Changing Sheds in Stadium Australia and in 1999, uh, they'd actually upgraded the stadium for the Olympics in 2000. They put biggest end stands on the end of the cell, on the end of the stadium. I think that was a record crowd, 107,000 people. Uh, that's the biggest grand final that's ever been played. And I remember sitting in the changing sheds and um, I wasn't nervous, but I was I was really, um, there was this real anticipation of, for me it was, I couldn't wait to get out there and play footy. You know, and I was just looking, looking so forward because 
everything that had driven me that previous year in terms of getting to that final had all fallen into place mm. in terms of that. So sitting in the changing sheds before we went out, I was quietly confident um, if we got our fair share of ball and we could play our style of football that we played, we'd win the game in terms of that. You, I mean, I, I remember watching that final and you were on fire. You were amazing. I mean, it, it looked like every person that you tackled, you were trying to send them home. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it just everything you did in that final. But the thing is, and people forget this, you were down 14-0 at half time. Yeah, the, the first half was a bit of a blur in terms of that. Um, we came out, um, you know, we didn't get into a rhythm, I think, because we had a lot of young guys. The only people that had played finals football was myself and Glenn Lazarus previously. So we had a lot of young kids. If you look at the average age of that team, uh, we had two centres, um, Tony Martin and Aaron Mule. One was 19, one was 20 years old. Marcus Bay was another old guy. We had Matty mm. Geyer. You know, we'd had a few injuries. We'd lost Robbie Kern, Scotty Hill, mm. our regular 5'8". But we just had a whole lot of young kids who were probably just a little bit nervous in terms of that. Uh, Brett Kamali was our halfback. And, um, but we had a good forward pack. And we knew if we could get to our game. So the first half, it was a blur. I remember walking off the footy field at halftime, looking up at the scoreboard. It was 14 nil, And I was just shaking my head and I walked up the tunnel. Steve Kearney was with the uh, – he came in 99 to the Melbourne Storm and I, and I grabbed him in the changing sense. I said, Steve, listen, mate, we've only got 40 minutes left and um, let's just rip in and I can rip the heads off in the second <laughs> half. So I remember walking into the chain sheds. Chris Anderson was our coach. He comes around. What he normally did he was just go around and see how people were, have a bit of a chat. Mm. And then um, I remember his halftime speech. He says, boys, just get the football in your hands and play some footy. That's, you know, he was a really good coach in terms of that. Chris kept things really, really simple, had a simple game plan, get a bit of momentum, play off the back of our forwards in terms of that, and then we'll create opportunities. So the second half we go out, um, we get a couple of good shots on, we get a bit of momentum and, and it's, we turn, the, turn that momentum into the second half and then, you know, it was <clears> – so a prelude to the game is Melbourne had actually wanted me to stay for another two years but I'd been offered a three-year contract to go back to England and play. And I, th and I knew before the match that it would probably be my last game in the NRL. And so that was part of the driving force in terms of me too, Julian, was really – you know, just leave everything out there on the field. So when you talk about me trying to smash everybody and do everything, it, it was probably, you know, I wanted to go out as a winner. I wanted to go out as a premiership winner. But I wanted to be uh, leave my mark on the game because it was the last game that I'd play in the NRL. Well, it wasn't just you smashing people. I mean, the runs that you were doing as well. I mean, I remember you were breaking tackles left, right and centre. And at the end of the game, people couldn't believe you didn't win man in the final. I mean, it, you it, you were stand up, head and shoulders, and I know you probably, you know, you'll be diplomatic and ambassadorial, and you'll say it's not about that. We won that's the main thing, but bro, you you were head and shoulders above everyone else on the field there. Yeah, I, I thought I'd but obviously the main thing was that we won the match, and then you know I'd, I'd set a goal when as a young fella growing up, I wanted to win a premiership in New Zealand, which I did with Otago, yeah. I wanted to win a premiership in Australia, and then I wanted to win a premiership in England. So, you know, those were the biggest the league areas, and but actually. Taking those young guys that we had through that process um, over the last two years, actually, you know, training really, really hard, putting all the dedication, the training, the commitment, you know, there's nothing better than winning the NRL Grand Final. And to actually win the Premiership in only our second year was absolutely amazing for the club and the organisation. What were you thinking at that pivotal moment in the Grand Final? Of course, there was a high kick into the goal area of St George. Uh, and um, the superstar referee <laughs> makes a final decision about a head-eye shot and, of course, gives a penalty try. But what were you thinking before that decision was made? What Were you thinking, wow, this could be it, or what are you saying to yourself? At no, time? I think when you're in the moment in the game, you're just all playing the football. You know, yeah. you leave those decisions up to the referee and stuff like that because I'd actually played the ball uh, to a hooker, um, Richard Swain, yeah, he right. passed it to Brett Kamali, and, and I was standing there, and played the ball and looked up, and I saw Smithy because we'd practice that at training all the time. You'd pr practice for the kickers. And when he put the ball up and I saw Smithy, I thought, he's going to catch this. So I was standing there watching. He caught the ball and I thought, he's going to score. 
Uh, but then, as you said, uh, head high tackle. So yeah, it was a really contentious decision. Um, in terms of that, Billy Billy Harrigan sent the, Billy sent Harrigan. it up. Billy Harrigan. So um, every time I see him, I always buy him a beer. Billy, <laughs> and just in just in times of a reminder of that. Uh, Hollywood Harrigan. <laughs> Hollywood Harrigan, that's right. Uh, cha- champion referee, but uh, it was the right decision in <laughs> yeah. terms of that. Had he not been uh, taken out with the close hanger high hit from uh, Jamie Ainsco, uh, we, you know he would have scored the try in terms of that. So, D- did you know you'd won then? Did you know? That no, no, we still because we got the penalty try, and then I think it evened it up. It was eighteen all, and then Matty Guy still had that's to right. kick the goal right. uh, to be twenty eighteen in terms of that for us, but. Uh, at that last, once we got the goal, you know, everyone sort of started talking and just making sure that we did uh, wind down. I think it was about three or four minutes in terms of that. So, you know, we went right down to the wire. But, you know, it's something that will live in folklore for Melbourne. Um, you know, our first premiership that we won at the club. And I'm still living off that. 25 years we had a reunion <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And uh, all the boys are still living off their victory, the first storm victory. So it's lasted for 25, quarter of a century already. And... Um, you know, just very privileged and proud to be part of that because it's always special when you yeah. win your first premiership. You know what I mean in terms of that for the club. Yeah, but for us as fans, I mean, when we see some of our own homegrown, yep. yep, like you, playing such a pivotal role and so well on the biggest stage, as you said, over a hundred thousand people watching that game. Um, you know, it must be for someone who who's played rugby league at home, brought up at home. Brought up with their whanau yeah. to be playing on the biggest rugby league stage in the world. And, oh, you know, we talk about New Zealand and England, you're right. But on the biggest rugby league stage in the world, it must just be. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. If you want to, you know, be a rugby league player and play the best, you've got to play in the NRL. You know, NRL grand finals. You talk to, you know, I've played with a lot of players that have played for years and years, never ever played in a grand final, never ever won a grand final. And then you go to, you know, you play with, Talk about players that won five or six grand finals, you know, in terms of that stuff. So it's always really, really special. But I think one of the things for being Māori, uh, being from home, you know, you're not just playing for yourself. You're playing for all those that, that have helped you uh, get to where you want to get to, your family, your whānau, you know, your nation. Very, very privileged and, and proud to have played. But, you know, it's, it's a privilege to play in the NRL. It's not a right. You have to earn the right. You know, in terms of that, and that's why I'm so happy with the Warriors, the Waz, you know, <laughs> they're going well at the moment. So hopefully, you know, it's been 27 years, I think, the Warriors have been in the competition. Still haven't won one, but yeah. it could be the year. Uh, um, you know, I just, I think back in, about it, and um, particularly when we think about you. I mean, there are Melbourne Storm supporters um, revere you. I mean, you, you've got a stadium named after you, Tawada. Yeah, I had, a, I had a stand named after you, but when they built the new one, I think it's a Billy Slater stand. Now. That was a long time <laughs> ago. But uh, yeah, no, Glenn Lazarus and I had a stand named after us at, in Melbourne at the, at the original graveyard. That was the original stand, said the Glenn Lazarus stand. You had the Tawada yeah. and Cal stand. But, so, but what's, but, what's it like for you when you go back to Melbourne and people just... Oh, man, I, I just can't believe that they still remember me from all those years. <laughs> like I said before, it's... Um, yeah, I was very privileged this year to be honoured as a life member mm. for the Melbourne Storm um, and going to the dinner and having people speak about the influence and the impact that you've had on the club and the legacy that you've left. Oh, it's a huge privilege, you know what I mean? Just very, very proud of what we've done. But I think, you know, when I first had the opportunity to go to Melbourne, I, I really, um, John Reber, who was the, mm. the original, the godfather, we call him, uh, Reeves of uh, Melbourne, he really talked about... Um, this vision that they had for Melbourne and one of the big reasons why they, they, they wanted me to come to Melbourne and they wanted me they brought me to come to Melbourne was they had a big expat, um, you know, Kiwi community, Māori, Pacifica, living in Melbourne. And one of the draw cards was to have me come down and, and represent those people too. So, you know, um, just hugely, um, you know, humbled mm. uh, by the... The genuine respect that I have from, from there's the There's a Waikato connection in Melbourne too, isn't there? I remember the Māori Chief Hotel and there's a portrait yeah, of Tafio. Yeah, Tafio in there. Yeah, went to the Chief Hotel. There's definitely, you know, I have a lot of Fando over there in Melbourne too and my aunties and cousins and that. And they were the first ones to sign up as Storm members and they, they're always <laughs> trying to, hey, cousin, have you got any spare tickets? <laughs> you know, to get into even the now. game. Even, even now. Even still now, still now. 25 years later, I said, go and buy your season tickets, mate, you know, <laughs> in terms of that stuff. But, you know, I, I think um, one of the great things is uh, 
a legacy that you leave behind uh, when yeah. you're in some of those positions. And I think, you know, very privileged. I recently took my, my daughters back to Melbourne and they said, oh, Dad, they, they think you're the best. They think you're the <laughs> king and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, and I just smiled to myself because, you know. It, because because it's true. It, it, it is true, but, you know, I get a little bit embarrassed sometimes. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, for us as Māori, we're still a little bit fucking a bit humble, you know, in terms of that stuff. Being, why? You know? Why do you think that is, and is that is that right? Should we be? Oh no, I, I think you should embrace it more. But you know, that's you know, when you think back. That's twenty five years ago. It's a quarter of a century. You know, that's a whole generation. You know, in terms of thinking that. So a lot of older people will know, but a lot of the younger generation don't. So, in terms of that, they look at the um, you know the Ryan Pappenhausens, the uh, you know the likes of those players now, they, which are fantastic and, and great players and still part of the club, but. You know, when you think back about it, um, but you know, but the word and you you mentioned it earlier, the word that comes to mind is is a legacy, yeah. And uh, whether you like it or not, not just in Melbourne, Castleford, um, it, you play for the Sharks as well, but yeah. the Kiwis, yeah, it's about building legacy, and and whether you are either conscious of this, and I suspect you are, um, but maybe choose not to embrace it as much as you possibly should, is because. You have left a legacy, not just in sport, but you have left a le legacy. And I wonder if that's something that you were conscious of at the time you were doing it or not. No, I, I don't think so. I think you play um, because you want to do the best that you can. And I think I was very fortunate to be brought up in a, you know, uh, a loving whanau, uh and having some good role models. You know what I mean? I think that's really, really important in terms of that stuff for me. So let, let's talk about that. First yeah. of all, where, where is home? Yeah, well, I live back at Matahuru, uh, which is uh, at Ohiniwai in, in the Waikato. Yeah, so that's our uh, papakainga. And um, when I came back from England when I retired, uh, there was only one place where I was going to go, and that's where I moved back and built myself a new whare back at our papakainga. Uh, back in the Waikato, so that's where I live right now in terms of that. Who yeah. were those role models that you talk about when you were growing up? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I was brought up with one of my nannies back at our marae and then um, one of my nanas, you know. I think for us in Waikato, there's a, there a huge um, leadership from our matriarchs in terms of that, you know what I mean? So uh, Dame Teata, you know, Te Puia. Uh, my nannies, you know, a lot of it, and my mum, you know, the females are very, very strong in, in, uh, in leadership roles within Waikato, and I've always been influenced by that in terms of that. So I think, you know, even my wife, my first wife, Letitia, and my wife now, Hayley, you know, there's always this um, admiration and respect, and especially from our older people, you know, we talk about... Uh, the Kingitanga, we talk about the Koronehana, we talk about the Regatta, all those stuff all uniting our people for the better cause, mm. you know, for the betterment, for the to whakamana or uplift our people in terms of that. So being brought up in that environment on our marae, uh, and one of my um, nannies that I was brought up with, uh, Wanana Moro, and then one of my other nannies who used to come and visit us all the time, Nanny Nā Kakatia. So she was 126 when she passed away, you know. I can remember the old lady sitting with my grandmother, and kōrero in Māori, you know, karakia, all that sort of stuff was really a big part of who I was and the growing up and the understanding. And my nanny nā and my nanny moro, um, they were both um, matakites, eh? they were both seers, both visionaries. And I remember my mum telling the story of when I was in my mother's womb and my nanny moro came up and said, uh, put her hand on her belly and told her the story of Tawera, uh, who he would be what he would become, and everything that she told my mum has come true to this day. Wow. Yeah, so when you think about that and the things that I'm doing now uh, are exactly what she'd said in and terms of that. I, I want to talk about the things that you are doing now because you are doing a lot, <clears throat> both at, at home and mm. generally for Waikato. But yeah. but what exactly did she say about Tawera when she put her hand on your mum's kōpū? Yeah, she talked about he'd be known all around the world and he would go on to do some great things. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's while I was still in that in the womb, you know, did, my mother's womb. Did you know about that when you were a child? No, I didn't. I didn't. It wasn't until I got older and then, you know, you know when you go to Tangis and you hear all the stories and you talk about whakapapa and genealogy and and then they started to come out then and talk about as I was a little bit older but not as a young child, you know, in terms of that. 
So it, it, was that when you became known as a rugby league player? That's when they started talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I, my dad thought I would become a doctor or a scientist or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, you know. Uh, but I ended up just playing rugby league, mate. That was it. <laughs> to be known all around the world. So, you know, those were sort of things he said, oh, you'd probably be a doctor or a scientist or something. But no, nah, it was just a rugby league <laughs> <laughs> Well, not just a rugby league player anymore. But, but <coughs> I mean, that, that presents itself with a whole bunch of responsibilities. Oh, right? 100%. And, way. you know, part of what I'm doing now, Julian, is uh, was already been foretold, so I know I'm on that right path. So, you know. And that's the, there's a real way to it. There's a real uh, you know spiritual connection in terms of that stuff, and you know it's all part of that well being. You know, going through the challenges I've been through. You know that 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 was all part of the the growth and the learnings. You know, you said I've left a legacy. I left a leg behind. You know, somewhere <laughs> along the way, in terms of that stuff. Uh, so, you know, a lot of those things have um, you know have come to fruition. Um, yeah. You know, and you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, in terms of, and more determined to to achieve what you want to achieve. But know? because of knowing what your nanny model, as you said, said yeah. about you, yeah. even before you were born, yeah. is that motivational? Is that driving force, or is that you th- thinking to yourself, okay, geez, I better live up to this? You know, I think it's a bit of both. I think yeah. it's a bit of both. You know, because you know, I didn't even know what you were saying before then, and but uh, to hear those stories afterwards and do what I'm doing now. And forging ahead with what I'm doing for our whanau, uh, for our hapu, and for our iwi shows that I'm on the right track. You okay. know what I mean? So, yep. and you know, who are people not to question me, but I know that I'm doing the right things for the right reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we, we get into that, I just yeah. wanted to mention one other thing about your playing career. I heard a rumor <clears throat> that when you first played for the Kiwis, you know, it's all fire and brimstone and all that oh, kind of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. it's a privilege and honour of being a Kiwi and all that kind of stuff. And I heard that when you first got the ball, that um, you had a specific target in mind, a man by the name of Ian Roberts, and um, who was who was a very tough and oh. hard player. Um, and you ran at him and he tackled you. And I heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that your immediate reaction was, what the heck just happened? And then you went into the kind of embryo position <laughs> and then and then felt the force and went, oh my gosh. Um and then and then realized test football is completely different to Oh, hundred percent. And that's a true story. I remember um playing against Ian Roberts. He was probably one of the most toughest and, and best tacklers in the game at the time. And uh we played in Melbourne. It was uh, nineteen ninety one. Uh, Roberts was playing in the team. They had uh, Steve Roach, uh uh, Ian Roberts, uh, Bobby Linder, you know, probably Mel Meninga, Wally Lewis, all the best players. So I got the ball, took the ball up, first hit up, and I was going to run straight at Ian Roberts, and he flattened me. He, you know, he hammered me. <laughs> Smashed me off my feet. I lost the ball. I was lying on the ground. Going, what the hell? <laughs> it was like running into a brick wall in terms of that. Uh, but, you know, that was a, that was the uh, determination and, uh, you know, the – what I wanted to sort of prove because, you know, you've got to go and play with the big boys. You, that's what you've got to do in yeah, terms yeah. of that. And then, yeah, did I run at him again? No, I sort of sidestepped him <laughs> the next time when I saw him in the line. I ran Good straight move. and did a bit of a sidestep. <laughs> he got move. past him. So I learned from that and you've got to be quick and nimble on your feet. But, you know, playing test football against some of the greats. And I remember Mel Meninga did the same thing. He ran straight at me, you know, in that same test match. I said, I'll get you, I'll smash you. I ran up, went to drop my shoulder, hit him. I don't know if you've seen those cartoons where people <laughs> run into a brick wall and they just slide down like that. It was exactly what happened to me. Mel Meninga dropped his hip, dropped his shoulder, ran straight at the top and he smiled and kept on running. <laughs> and I was lying on the ground like this thinking I've just been run over. So I got smashed by Ian Roberts and run over the top of by Mel Meninga. Hey, you hey, know. but but um, but um, but two heroes of Australia. Oh. I mean, Ian Roberts, I mean, look at him now. He's, he's oh. He is a, um, an, a respected and admired figure. Yeah. In Australia, Mel Meninga, I mean, oh my gosh. Oh. Not, not only a great player, but one of the greatest coaches. 100%, you know, so, you know, play against those guys. And, and, you know, badge of honour. It was a badge of honour for them, to, but yeah. <laughs> but we won the game, so I was happy with that. So <laughs> got smashed, got run over, but we still won. Because uh, that, that game, you scored in that game. Yeah, we scored Under the try. post. Yeah, yep. uh, yeah, Gary Freeman put a little grubber kick through when we won the game first. You now, we were right outsiders. They had Wally Lewis, they had Mel Meninga, they had, the, you know, the best players that ever played the game, Alfie Langer. 
And then uh, we were on a hiding to nothing, but, you know, the boys were the underdogs. Mm. Uh, Richie Blackmore played, Jared McCracken, yeah. it was those young guys. And once again, um, you know, it was a fantastic um, – that's why I love Melbourne so much. I've won there quite a bit, you know, <laughs> the Melbourne Storm, the Kiwis. Uh, so, yeah, there was a – that was, uh, was very <clears throat> memorable. I, I, I have to tell you, you know, we, I was a toady at the time. We weren't allowed to grow our hair. <laughs> but, <laughs> Did you have the buzz cuts? Did you have the yeah, we, we had buzz cuts. But um, and after that game, I got to go on an exchange to America, so I was allowed to grow my hair. And I tried to grow. A uh, <laughs> <laughs> It looks horrendous. It, it, it didn't look like how I thought it looked. I felt like, well, you know, I was trying to be you. Um, and I felt pretty cool. I looked ridiculous because it didn't look any. <laughs> it didn't look anything like him, but um, I felt pretty cool. Um, it, it had the opposite effect of what I thought it would have on um, members of the opposite sex, um, who, who in America who, who weren't into it. <laughs> but um, I mean, did you know that you were a cult figure? At oh, the time? not at the time. I, I suppose as I got it, really, uh, uh, every mighty boy playing league was trying to. Yeah, grow, grow a mullet, I think so. But I think, you know, at the time when you're playing football over in England and then back in Australia and everything else like that, at the time I didn't really think it was a cult figure. But I remember when I got to Cronulla and I came back from the UK, uh, there was a big survey they'd done about around mullets in terms of that. And it was like um, Billy Ray Cyrus was number one in the <laughs> world. Uh, there was another fellow. But I think I was number three, came up some big survey in Australia who's, who had the best mullets. <laughs> Now Ryan Pappenhausen is trying to take over my um, my title. At <laughs> Following Melbourne, your footsteps at the Melbourne Storm. So, Following your but yeah, um, I think you know, haircuts go come in and go out of style, and I think mm. the mullet's back in again. Yeah, know, in terms of that. And, and I just want to circle back a little bit more, if you don't mind, in rugby league, because as you said, you played for Otago, a great club, great club. I mean, I, I used to hate. Auckland rugby clubs in general because I was a Ramwick Kingfishers fan. Oh, yeah, from Wellington, yeah, yeah King, back, Kingfishers, yeah. Back in the day, um, you know, we never won anything because we came to Auckland and the bling and what was then well, called the Tusk, Tusk Cup. Cup. Yeah, I remember in watching those games, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Randwick, I think they played Otahu in the final one year, yep, was it? Yep. And Frank North Coat, we played North Coat, got done. Um, uh, Mount Albert got done. Um, my, my hero, I have to be honest with you, I have a second row loose forward hero. Sam Stewart was one of my. Oh, own yeah, no, Sammy, you know, I played with Sammy in the Kiwis in the Newcastle yeah, Knights. He was, uh, you you know, the Henny Penny he Newcastle Knights. Yeah, he was yeah. a red inaugural captain, I think he was. Yeah. Might have been at um at Newcastle, yeah, Sammy yep. Stewart. But he played did he play for Randwick? Who did yeah, he, he did, yeah. He played Randwick. Randwick and then he went over to Newcastle. Yeah, yep. yeah. That's right. Um and then and then aside from that, not other many luminaries. But anyway, the Rasmussen's and anyway. Yeah. But um but as a kid growing up, I mean, you know, that must have been really formative in your rugby league career because club rugby league in New Zealand was so strong. Oh, it was back, back in, in those in days. In the 80s and late 70s, 80s. You had a national club competition, yeah, which was yeah. absolutely fantastic yeah. for the game. And, you know, you go to Wellington, you go to Christchurch, you go Auckland, you know, Waikato, you know, you'd have all those games. And, and league in those days was growing up and playing in the Waikato was fantastic. And I actually played, we had a Fano team, the Rangaduri Eels. So my uncles played, my cousins played, my brothers played, and we played in the Waikato competition. Tani Faro and Turanga were always too good. Uh, they were the top teams in our region, but you know, growing up and playing with my brothers, uh, playing with my cousins, playing with my uncles was absolutely um, a great way to, you know, those formulative years. I thought it was really fit, you know, playing league um, back in those days. Cause you go pig hunting, you go play football, you know. My uncles would come out of the mines on a Saturday, come and play rugby league on the, on the Saturday afternoon, you know, so they were big tough fellas, you know what I mean? So, so I think I was playing first grade when I was like 16, you know, years old. So it was a really good grounding and introduction to what um, football was. And, and let's you know? be honest, you know, it was tough. Oh, it was like a lot tougher. Old fellas, you know, they yeah, they would, they'd get you. If you weren't fast enough, if you weren't clever enough, they'd, they'd wring your neck, and, you know, playing against some of the old Tani Faro guys like Barna Hitomia and Pop Raihi and yeah. all those guys, you know, all the Māori. They played for New Zealand Māoris, Ricky Muru, you know, all yeah. those guys. They were, they were good, bloody tough players, you know what I mean? You know, so you had to be good in terms of that. So was the plan always to play professionally that was always what you wanted to do not always I think when I first finished school was just playing football was great you know play with my mates and play with my cousins and play with my whanau but as I started getting pretty good at the game and I realized that hey you know I can make a living out of this I might be a good opportunity to go to England and play and you know play professionally I started taking it a lot more serious why you know, England why England first and not Australia yeah I, th I think everybody you know I, I grew up uh, as a youngster uh, watching, you know, the likes of uh, James Lillewai and oh, Fred Arkoy yeah. playing at Wembley, you know, in the yeah. Challenge Cup final. 
and you see like 100,000 people and you think, man, wouldn't that be awesome to go and watch those games? So we didn't used to get the NRL games. Yeah. They, used to, used, they used to come in tapes. You yeah. have to go down to the local video store right. on a Thursday, get the tape and then watch the games from the previous week. Yeah. So we didn't get to see them because you only had TV1, TV2, TV3 in those days. You know, you didn't have had Sky. So, so we used to see a lot more the English football as a youngster growing up in terms of it. So I always had this this dream to, to head over to England and, and play over there. And then I got the opportunity to travel and to uh, get selected in the Kiwis and then went to England and then sort of pretty much stayed and came back home and then went back again, you know, and sort of... So playing in the UK was... Uh, I really loved playing in England because the supporters are fantastic. You know what I mean? They were great. Massively tribal, eh? Hugely tribal. So very similar. More tribal than Waikato. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much so. It was very similar, you know, to being like back home in terms of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, you know, Huntley was a coal mining town. Yeah. Castleford was a coal mining town. You know what I mean? So I understood the culture and I understood the people and they, they loved you. If you played really, really well, if you played your best, mate, they they loved you. The fans would support you. They'd sing songs about you. I never had to buy a beer while I lived in Castleford. Every time <laughs> I'd go to the pub, there was always a pint on the, on the thing, you know, go out for dinner. Food would be all free, you know, you'd go down town, you didn't have to pay for anything, it was unreal, you know, in terms of that. So, you know, there was this real uh, sense of uh, tongue, I suppose, or family feeling because I felt really comfortable, you yeah. know, because it was just like playing football at home. And if you went out there and played well, mate, you could do anything you wanted, you know. And, of course, you, when you won the NRL in 99 yep. with the Melbourne Storm and then you go back to England, yes, could you feel the pull of home? Then were you starting to think then when you did the second stint in England that you you, you might have to come home at some stage? Yeah, well, I had a bit of a plan. My plan after Melbourne, see, is I um, – because I went back to England. So Melbourne had offered me a two-year deal uh, for 2000 and 2001 to stay good in deal. Melbourne. It was a good deal, really good deal. Uh, but I'd been offered a three-year deal back in England at Warrington and the money was – the pound was a lot more attractive back in those days and it was a lot better. But – what I was going to go back to England was is that I wanted to play for another three years and I would coach in the UK. So it would give me an opportunity to pathway into coaching because I wanted to come back and coach in New Zealand, coach the Kiwis, probably coach in the NRL. So that was my bigger plan in terms of what I really wanted to do mm. in terms of that. So the bigger picture was the long game in terms of that. So whilst Melbourne was good, I'd done what I wanted to do and won the grand final and I sort of probably knew that was going to be my last game the, the grand, and it's a good way to go out so you can't – no better way to go out yeah. than winning the premiership and then being left to, um, and then going back to England to you know start the next career path of my journey of uh, playing for another three years and then coaching in the UK. See, as we talk about this and review this, people would think, man, this guy's had a charmed life. But as we know, it's not, it hasn't no. always been that way. No, no. Um, and, and it's not like I want to get into specifics. Oh, no, I can talk about that because, uh, you know, sharing the story about what happened to my wife, Letitia, and uh, going through that process, probably the toughest, you know, toughest thing that's ever happened, have, having to deal with. So how do you deal with it? <sighs> well, it was it was a real challenge because I'll, I'll go back and – so what had happened in 2000 and 2001. So 2000, 1999, we'll finish the grand final. 2000, I'll go back to Warrington. We have a good year in 2000. Uh, then we have the World Cup in 2000. So I get to captain the New Zealand Māori team into the World Cup okay. in 2000, yeah. which was, you know, another goal of mine. And some, so to lead the New Zealand Māori team into the World Cup yeah. was absolutely fantastic. Um, 2001 rolls around. We'd done a bit of review. We'd gone to a place called Lanzarote in the Grand Canaries off the west coast of Africa, and we had a training camp for a couple of weeks. And I remember coming back home, and then I went up to the school. My son had been uh, at cricket training. I went to pick him up time. And I left, went up to the home, and I came back home. And when I came back home, it was dark. It had just gone on dark, and I noticed that the, there was a, a light on in, in the garage. And I thought, oh, that's a bit strange. The light wasn't on. And then I pulled in the driveway, drove, parked the car at the front of the house, and I walked around the back into the garage and I went to turn the light off and I and I saw something, the shadow hanging in the right of the garage. And I turned around and it was my wife, Letitia. She'd got an extension cord and hung herself from the ceiling. So it was probably the most harrowing uh, thing you have to ever, ever deal with in terms of that. Um, and this this complete numbness as you go through this, you know, so I cut it down, rang an ambulance, my daughter was upstairs. My son was there. 
bring some friends. And you just go through this, um, it was this mind-numbing pain that, you know, sort of went on. I was really lucky I rang uh, Kevin Tamani, KT. He lived just down the road from me. So I rang him. Also David Kidwell was uh, at Warrington at the time and one of my other cousins, Marty Moana, was up mm. in Halifax. So they all came around um, and for the next probably seven or eight days it was just this whole roller coaster of emotion of, you know, going through this anger, frustration, guilt, what the hell had happened, you know, all these different emotions. You're on this bit of this freaking roller coaster ride. And um, it took me about ten days to to get through the all the paperwork, all the all the stuff, and you know you're just in and out of this incoherent state, I suppose the word is. And, and um, finally got everything organised, and and we got to come back to New Zealand. So when I left England with the body and with two children on the plane to come home, uh, when I got back home, I was fine. But that whole period of time. From when it actually happened to actually getting home was a bit of a blue. It was this real emotional, uh, numbing roller coaster of anger, frustration, guilt, all this, all these different emotions. But when I got back home, I was fine. Got back home, saw my parents, uh, went up to the moment, and did this, and then because my children have never been to a tangi, they've never been to a tangi in New Zealand, or because they've been brought up in Australia and brought up in England, the first tangi they ever went to was their mother's tangi on Mamarai in terms of that. So I was home for a couple of weeks and I felt a lot better. And at the time, Leticia, she was my manager. She'd managed all my contracts, done everything, you know, the love of my life. Had this beautiful family, two beautiful kids, uh, you know, had this plan, everything mapped out, what we were going to do, where we were going to go. And all that was gone in an instant, you know, just taken away. So I was home there for a couple of weeks and then I sort of made the decision to go back to Warrington and, and finish off my contract. Um, you know, in, in terms of the honouring, honouring my wife and, and what had happened, um, for me was the least that I could do in terms of what had happened. So I went back to Warrington, took the kids back there because um, I just wanted to finish the season off, and that was me. I was going to retire after that in terms of that. But I got back to Warrington. When I got back to Warrington, uh, I had a coach, Daryl Vanderbilt, good mate of mine, Daryl. And when I got back there, he said, "T, um, I said I've organised for you to go and get some counselling." And I said, yeah, I don't need that. He goes, no, nah, no, nah, I've made an appointment for you. You can go see the counsellor because you need to talk to someone about what's happened and how you're going to deal with it. What do you think I said, uh, Julie? <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, no. Nah, so we got Maori uh, male yeah, response. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 100%. You know, yeah, no, I'll be all right, mate. I'm a sweet ass. So um, we got back there and we still had about another four and a half, five months of the season to go. And then... Like I was someone that prided myself on my fitness and my well-being and, you know, I didn't really drink much. I probably drank two or three times a year when I'd go home, have a drink with my dad and my brothers and at the end of the season would have a big drink with the boys. But I really didn't drink much. My way of dealing with what had happened to my wife, Letitia, was to hit hit the piss pretty – hit hit the bottle pretty hard. And in terms of that was mainly just vodka and whiskey and gin, you know sort of trying to deal with that, trying to numb the pain, uh, that emotions. And this went on for about three three months. I'd miss training sessions. I'd miss recovery sessions after the game. You know, I'd just go out and get smashed. Um, and I was going through that process for about three or four months. And then Daryl, the coach, turned up on my door. He said, T, right, come with me. Threw me in the car. Took me to the counsellor and just made me have the session. So even when I went to the counsellor, went to the office that day, I'm – sitting at the front in the office and knocked on the door, I still got this thought in my head that, yeah, what the hell am I doing here? Yeah. This is bullcrap. Right. This is what you think. 100%. Yeah. That's, those were my thoughts. I don't need this shit. Mm. They don't know me. They don't know who I am, where I've mm. come from, what I've had to deal with. Mm. You know, so that was the that was the view that I had. I walked into the office, sat down on the chair, and the um, therapist or the um, psychologist said, oh, listen, I'm just going to ask you a few questions and, you know, you can just tell me how you feel and what you're thinking. Still really negative, you know, I didn't want to be there, shrugging my shoulders. And, and, that. and then she started talking and asking me a few questions and then probably went on for about half an hour, 40 minutes in terms of that. And uh, she goes, oh, no, that's it. And, and when I walked out of that room, I felt this huge uh, weight lift off my shoulders in terms of that because it wasn't really about me. It was just... She was just asking how I was feeling, 
what my thoughts were. It was not judgmental or anything along those lines. It was really around just talking about how I was feeling in terms of that. And this went on for probably another four months while I was for the remainder of my time that I was at Warrington. And I'd go every fortnight and sit down. Every time I left the office and I felt a little bit better, I could see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel uh, because, you know, when you go through that process of losing a loved one or losing everything, you know, I had to really focus on my children at that time, you know. Yeah, what's happened's happened. Can't control what's happened, but you can control and determine what the future's going to look like. Did it feel like you were, you were in a tunnel, incredibly dark? Oh, it was. And a tunnel yeah. going downwards, right? Going down, it? going down, and it was getting darker and dark, wow. you know, in terms of that. That's how it felt. But, you know, yeah, after every session, there was a little bit of light, you know, a little bit of you know, things became a little bit clearer. Because these all these thoughts that go through your head, you know, what am I going to do now? How am I going to look after these kids? What's going to happen? You know, mm -hmm. where are they going to grow up? You know, all those sort of things that continuously go around in your head. In terms of coming from all I had to worry about was playing football and doing the best that you can to having to deal with all this other stuff now. It just mounts all that pressure on you. And I don't know whether it's depression or not because I'd never – I didn't know about depression. This is 25 years ago, mm -hmm. Julian, you know. People never talked about that stuff, you know. Yeah, it just got brushed under the carpet and you just left there and you sort of harden up, move on and then get on with life, you know, in terms of that stuff. But uh, I really, really um, – Daryl, who was a coach, was someone that really, really helped me through that time. And when I came back home, I actually carried on doing the counselling for about another 12 months. It took me 18 months. And then I took my children to the counselling also, took them through the process. Yeah, I was, was going to ask you what the, in terms of the that, impact Because that of was – you know, if, you, if you're – you know, two kids brought up in this world where yeah. you, you didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Your mother ran after around after you did everything. You know, they'd lived lived a not a privileged life, but you know, a, a really a great life to be travelling, to go around the world, to not have to worry about anything. You know, in terms of that stuff there. And my wife Letitia looked after all that. You know, all I had to do was my job was just go there, and play the best football you can, just yeah. worry about training, performing every week. You know, in terms of an expectation level. But now all this other stuff. You know, you're having to deal with that. Yeah. And, so, and yeah. The, the other thing is you're not just having to deal with that for you and your kids, but you're also having oh. to deal with that with me, with media. Oh, the whole world. You know, yeah. you're, you're like a fish. In Everyone's fish talking about Everyone's it. Everyone's talking about it. what's happened, how's he going to manage, you know. So I played the remainder of the season at Warrington, saw it my contract, and then I hung my boots up. I knew that was it. You know, the, the spark, uh, the fire, the love of rugby league, it's sort of – Mm. moved on, you know, I, my main focus now was making sure that my kids were going to be okay. You know, that was the focus for me, Julian, in terms what, of that. What's the ongoing impacts of the kids losing their mum being, if any? Oh, there's some massive impacts, you know. Here, here you go, my daughter at the time, Kevin was, I think she was 11. Yeah. My son, Time, was eight. So to lose someone in your life who did everything and was uh, the apple of your eye in terms of that stuff, you know, the ongoing impacts my daughter still, you know, has some issues around, you know, um, drugs, alcohol, you know, dealing with what's happened to her in terms of that, you know. My young fella, you know, one's good, one's bad, but, you know, it, it does have an ongoing effect on their whole life yeah. in terms of that stuff and continues to do so. And, and again, publicly, word gets out. That's, yeah, and, um, you know, it must be really tough as a father just trying to look after kids oh, with people with normal, it. With the normal, yeah, yeah. normally, you know. I, yeah. That's why I've taken my head off to people, who, you know, who bring up children and single parent families and stuff like that because the challenge is, is so demanding. In terms D of, does it, it, I mean, it must suck being a public figure in those times. Oh, Because you don't get to control anything. No, you don't. Everything's, you know, you're that fishbowl in this, in this big... Uh, this big world, global, on a global stage. And so having to deal with all that stuff. So, you know, going back home to where I was, to everybody I knew was really good. So getting yeah. back to New Zealand was really great, not only for myself but for my family. And also that, that wairu, that spiritual side in terms of that, being back home in New Zealand and having a good support network, you know, having my family, uh, my close friends around me was, you know, yeah, it was really important. When you came back, did you know what the plan was going to be? No, I didn't. Not at the time. Not at the time, Julie. No. How long did it take you to figure out? Because, you see, look, you're doing so much stuff at the moment. You know, housing development, social well-being, 
but I, yeah. trustee, yeah. you know, director of the Inter- yeah. rugby league, all that kind of stuff. It, it seems like you pretty much had a plan. <laughs> my only plan at the time was to come home and then try and um, make sure that my kids were okay. okay. You know, that was the focus for me. And I sort of, you know, going through the counselling with the counsellors and stuff like that, that really sort of gave me a bit of focus, you know yeah. what I mean? Because I don't have to worry about anything, you know, financially or anything else like that. It was fine. It was really around just the well-being piece of my children. You were set for life. Yeah, when you came. pretty much in terms of that stuff, you know. Wow. Uh, so because of the way that we'd structured what we were doing and everything else like that. But, yeah, getting back home and just making sure the kids were good, that was the only focus. I didn't have a plan at the time. It was just come back home, chill out, relax, uh, and just get into some structure in terms of what that did. The phone I start knocking on the door and saying, <laughs> Huntley needs a mayor, boy. <laughs> Because there were lots of rumours also about people wanting you to stand for politics. Yeah, there was. There was a whole lot of different things. But, you know, I think one of the things that was interesting for me was, like, coming back in – because I hadn't lived in New Zealand for nearly 20 years. Yeah. You know, it had been a while. And just really coming back to to the whānau and, and the family and, and the, that transition of what living life, you know, spending about eight to ten years in, in the UK, another five years and back in Australia, six years and going back to the UK again – you know, I'd been away for you know, nearly 18, 20 years in terms of that. So coming back home was really about just re-establishing your roots in yeah. terms of that. Although I was always always grounded and we all, you know, knew where I came from, but it was just really coming back and reaffirming what that was. So just just so I'm clear, when people ask you to stand for politics or you know, <laughs> become the mayor or um, or uh, stand for Te Aratauta, <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did you consider any, any of those? Yeah. Not at the time. At the time, I didn't because you know my main focus was on the kids in okay. terms of that. I think that was further on down the track as stuff started developing. Yeah. Uh, you know, kids got older and they started going on their own ways. Then I started to look at some of those things. Definitely, yeah. Why did you not stand for politics? Because everyone that I talked to, at the time that it was being talked about, and. Uh, you know, and I know that you would have had to stand against your no, own no, relation. Yeah, I know for knowing it, yeah. Um, everyone said if you stood, you would have won. Yeah, I think one of the things, Julian, was that, you know, I had a huge amount of respect for, you know, I talked about our matriarchs and the people who are leaders within our Waikato Tainui and uh, Nanaya was someone that had been done the hard yards, you know, in terms of that stuff. She'd been around for a while. She was absolutely fantastic. She'd done a lot of things for our people and, you know, being far note and related in terms of that stuff, I thought she was the best candidate. I didn't want to be a fly by nighter. And as you look at all the politicians that we know in politics, Julian, uh, you know, a lot of people have really great intentions. But I think you know, after a while, and I spoke to a few people that had been involved in that. Yeah, you tend to compromise on some of those values uh, as you go through, and that's what you have to do in politics. You understand that. And you know, for me, I was just sort of I was always been brought up in a strong values base. So you know, making sure okay. and maintaining that uh, I is understand important. Now. You know, because. That's the thing about being brought up in the community that you're brought up with, as you say, that matriarchal society, where female leadership, but values, ethics, morals, oh, 100%. principles. That's been you all the way through, right? Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Um, we talked a little about legacy, uh, and then you did a nice play on words <laughs> with leg. Um, I've heard you talk about this before, and um, so we'll we'll be going over old ground here. Yeah. Um, but you you explained it when I've heard you talk about it. I went to a sports presentation. Actually, it was a mighty sports presentation in Rotorua, where um, the inimitable and indefatigable <laughs> Bailey Mackey said, "We've got to go along and listen to Tawera." And you talked about this in a very matter of fact way in terms of the accident and what happened with your leg. And you made like a pretty calculated decision, which was ah, too cut much it rehabilitation, off. cut it off. Is that literally? Pretty much. It was pretty much what had happened. I'd been in the hospital for six weeks, Julian, and they were trying to save the leg. And um, the So w- what happened? Oh, so I actually – so I grew up riding and racing motorbikes, and then when I retired and I came back home to Huntley after my wife had passed away, I thought, well, I'm going to get me a brand-new Harley. So I got a brand-new Harley. I used to ride motocross and ride enduro, so I knew how to ride bikes. I grew up riding bikes all my life. But I actually was coming back from Hamilton, had the bike serviced then. I was heading back home to where I live, came around the corner and basically the guy cut the corner and crashed straight into me. So um, as a result of the accident, ended up spending six weeks in hospital. Uh, The doctor comes in on a Friday afternoon and says, Mr. Nikau, listen, I've got some good news and some bad news. 
I said, what's the good news, Doc? He said, well, the bad news. He said, well, the bad news is you might have to stay in hospital for another 12 to 18 months and we'll try and save your leg. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we're going to take some bone off the hip, basically fuse it to the bottom of the heel because I'd smashed my old heel. Then we're going to take some bone off the other side of your hip, put that on the bottom of your ankle and your knee because it smashed the bone all in the lower leg of my um, right leg. And then we're going to take the lat muscle off one side of your back and the lat muscle off the other side and we'll graft that around there, have a few more operations, do some more skin grafts. And then we still don't know whether or not you'll be able to use your leg again. I said, yeah, that's not too bad, 12 to 18 months. I said, what's the good news? He said, the good news is if you cut it off, you'll be out of here in three days. I said, what? He said, Mr. Kneecap, if you have the leg amputated below the knee, you'll be out of hospital in, you know, in three to four weeks walking. And I said, Doc, I'm a rugby league player. You want me to cut my leg off? He said, well, that's the good news and the bad news. I'll, I'll see you later on. I'm going to go and do the rest of my rounds. So yeah, after being in six weeks and having all these operations, he said, you can stay here for another 12 to 18 months or you can have your leg amputated and you'll be out of hospital in a couple of weeks. So um, turned around to my mum. My mum was sitting there at the end of the bed. Turned around and said, mum, what do you think I should do with my leg? Your bloody leg, you can do whatever you <laughs> want to do with the bloody thing. Told you not to buy that motorbike. You didn't <laughs> listen to me then, did you? So um, so there I was. And then um, later on that afternoon, I was, you know, so this was, I'd been home for about 12 months. Mm -hmm. My children had just lost their mum. I was going to be in hospital for another 12 to 18 months. You know, my daughter just started high school. Son was just starting, you know, college. Who was going to look after them? I was going to be stuck in hospital for another 12 to 18 months. Who was going to be looking after them? What were they going to do? So I said, nah, cut the bloody thing off. So the next day, I had the operation, cut the leg off. I was out of hospital within two weeks. I was up and running again in about four weeks' time. So best decision I ever made because um, – you know, I've talked to a lot of people that have had accidents on motorbikes and they try and save their leg for years and years and years and just go through all the pain and, you know, the uh, amputations and everything else. So, yeah, that was in 2004. What's that? Nearly 20-odd years ago. Had my leg amputated. Only thing I can't do now is run as fast as what I used to, you know. <laughs> So yeah, you can still do everything else, Julian. So yeah, that was and another. And still run was, faster than some of us. Yeah. I have to say, <laughs> still run. Don't know. You know, I never done a marathon until I cut my leg off. So I decided to do you know three or yeah. four different New York marathons. Done a whole lot of different stuff. Hundred k races, enduro races. So wow. Yeah. So the challenge and you know doing that stuff is that was that was two thousand and four, as you said. Yes. Two thousand and six, you get presented with the opportunity of a lifetime. It's a television program. <laughs> Uh, let me let me mention some of the other mythical Māori <laughs> figures that are involved in this program. Uh, Slade McFarlane, possibly, possibly one the greatest rugby league player with the name Slade. <laughs> uh, um, Matua Parkinson. I mean, you know what more can be said about Matua Parkinson that hasn't already been uh, incorrectly pronounced by Willie Jackson. Um, um, Jenny May Coffin, uh, now a media personality, yeah, uber media May. person. Yeah. Rewa Harriman. Yeah. Uh, former New Zealand tennis number one. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else. Oh yeah, and some ball bags. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and you get asked to do this television show called Code, which which goes on to after the absence of one particular person becomes a great show. <laughs> 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 when some, one person gets kicked off the show because he's sacked, um, the show becomes awesome. Um, um, did you ever think of doing media? No, I never. That was another thing that, you know, um, I never thought about it actually in terms of that stuff because I was pretty happy, you know. When you're in uh, professional rugby league, you always have some, what's the word, mistrust, I suppose, of the media, you know. Well, and, fair enough given you know, what you'd had to go through. Yeah, in terms of that stuff. But, you know, you're always wary of the media and you're always wary of journalists in terms of that stuff. So, you know, you have this sort of negative view. But when the opportunity came for Māori television in the in the program or code, it was um, – Oh, I thought, wow, this could be pretty cool. Sounds like something I wouldn't mind doing. And yeah, uh, like you said, Julian, we were on that the original cast. You were on that original cast, but then after that, it got better when you left the show. So <laughs> I think it was. Um, no. you know, the, the other thing, of course, about that was, aside from you and Jenny May, there weren't many world class athletes. So, you know, <laughs> uh, Rewa was a great athlete, but the rest of us, um, oh, I just remember the opening titles, you know, Tawana Nico, Kiwi Legend, you know, NRL Grand Final winner, English Premiership winner, da -da -da, Jenny May, Coffin, da -da -da, Matua, and then it came to the, me, which was like, you know, um, 1991, <laughs> 400 meters. <laughs> 400 meters. <laughs> 
Um, but the show goes massive. Oh, it was huge. I think it was the biggest show that in sports show in New because it used to be Sports Cafe, which was yeah. now on TV. But yeah. I think Code sort of blew that all away, and um, it was a good run there for many, many years. And I, I think they're talking about having a, uh, a revisit show for this year. F- or funny, I didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're talking about bringing it back 20 odd years later or something. They're having a revive show or something like that. Yeah, no, I'm not too sure. But, but, but it was, but, I never thought about doing that, Julian, in terms of being involved in the media. So it was just a really great opportunity to get out there and, and something that, you know, I, I really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then that carries on. I mean, you do match fit. Yeah. Which, which, which is amazing. And um, did you realize that many athletes, many people actually that you played with or certainly knew in rugby league um, and, and in rugby. Did, did, did you <clears throat> realise at the time that so many former champion athletes, players, were having such a hard time? Not so many. I knew there was the odd one or two. You hear of certain stories of certain players that have gone through some real tough challenges. But um, I know with the Match Fit series was really about reconnecting with those guys and and the journeys that they've been on after football. You know, and that was the real, you know, we've seen some high-profile cases quite recently about, mm. you know, um, a couple of players. But in terms of that stuff, I didn't realise how big there was. There, there was that many of them that had gone through some challenges, not only, um, you know, physically and health-wise, but the mental mm. mental side of the game in terms of that. Why? Know. I mean, I understand why it was so tough for you, given what had happened. Oh. Why is it so tough for people to transition out of professional sport um, to go on and undertake a career or other employment opportunities or whatever it is? Yeah, is it the discipline thing or something? Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. You know, for most um, clubs now, most people in the NRL, they have to go and do some other stuff. You know, they, the younger guys now must go to uni, must do some sort of trade and everything else like that to transition themselves because when you look at a lot of those players now, the time in the game is a lot shorter for them, you know, in terms of that seven to eight years average. In terms of if you're really good, 12 to 15 for uh, rugby league players, you know what I mean? So when you think about that, you've got to have, be planning for life after football. In our era, it was, you know, go and do the best that you can. You didn't have the, um, you know, NRL support players around you or, you know, your well-being officers and stuff like that, uh, careers development stuff. But most clubs, all clubs now, have to have a, a pathway for people coming into the into their clubs yeah. in terms of that. Do, do you, I mean, do your eyes water the amount of money that's available now? What, in terms of that for players? Yeah. Oh, I, I think it's a lot different. See, we never had salary caps in our day. And so the money was a lot different in terms of that. And then, you know, I know when the Super League war came along, if you talk about players on a million dollars back in the 90s, you'd had players on a million dollars. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah. wow, I didn't even know. Yeah, there was players signed up for uh, Super League and stuff that were on you know, astronomical amounts of money in terms of that. So... Um, with the salary cap and what's happened to the game, it's uh, I think it's changed for the better. You've got you know minimum wage now for players that are playing football. Uh, you've got super into, uh, superannuation. We we had all those when we were playing in terms of that, and it was a lot different. But I think it's a lot better for the players. And then you know we have our women's games now. You know, woman the pathway for women. That's the biggest growth in rugby league is our Waikini that are playing the game. There's so many good talent. How important do you think that is? Let's stick on the the women in rugby league now. How important is that? Do you think for Māori? Because oh man, because, it's a massive pathway. It's, oh, yeah. a, it's a great pathway for our for our for our, you know what and all those younger ones coming through because you know you can actually play and we've seen a crossover from a lot of the rugby union girls because you actually get to play in a, a real tough competition where you know you're generally getting paid you know a a, a real wage you know a, a real um, real money for what you're actually doing yeah. in, in professionalism. So yeah, look, Tyler Nathan Wong and those ones, right? Well, yeah. Gail yeah. Broughton. Gail Broughton. No, they deserve it, mate. They're, they're Māori, you know, they've got they've done really well in the sevens, but it's only a couple of tournaments. This is like, you know, you can play. And as this grows, I know that Melbourne Storm are talking about having a, a women's team in the next wow. couple of years. You know, so all those other clubs have to come up to grade. The, the Warriors, they've got another two years, there'll be a women's team with the Warriors. How great yeah. would that be? Yeah. You know what I mean? So the pathway there for our young rangatahi in terms of that and our wahine uh, is absolutely fantastic. You became you were on the New Zealand Rugby League board. Yes. <clears throat> what was that like? I mean, people talk about 
players becoming board members is kind of like um poacher turned gamekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is serious control of the game in New Zealand, right? Well, I think, you know, the transition from where the game used to be and who it was run by, um, and you used to have this old, pale, stale, white male <laughs> in terms of the game, it didn't represent the demographic of the people that play our Well, game. look at the Kiwis team now. Exactly. In terms of that, you know, so uh, the transition has been challenging, uh, but we're at a really good place now. You know, yeah. We've got uh, Māori, we've got Pacifica representation on the New Zealand board, we've got... Uh, Female, you have Honey Hedemi of Smilers on the board. You know, you've got some great people. John Devonshire from Māori Rugby League can now have a permanent seat on NZRL on board. Mm. So that's, um, you know, one of the great things about it that New Zealand Māori have a dedicated seat that sits on New Zealand Māori rug on the New Zealand Rugby League board. Do you mind if I raise a particular issue with you? You can raise it. <laughs> We've had, um, so Steve Cooney, player turn coach, won a World Cup. Yep. Uh, man you mentioned earlier, David Kidwell, who had, who had all the credentials, all the necessary credentials to be a good coach. Yep. Gives that a go and it doesn't, doesn't work out. Right? We've now got an Aussie. Yep. And I don't know how much you can say. Um, but um, it, 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 it hurts me. <laughs> it's a, no, that's, it a fair, hurts. that's a fair question in terms of that, Julian, and I, I, I respect that in terms of that. So you've got to ask the hard questions. So one of the things that we are transitioning to is, uh, if you look at who Michael Maguire's assistant coaches are, yeah. I think one of them will be Stacey Jones, yeah. another one is Nathan Kalis. Uh, we have some support as the Kiwi selectors, myself, Stephen Kearney, mm -hmm. in terms of that. So we are looking to transition, is the word, into having um, coaches at that higher level. Uh, currently in the game in terms of that. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Michael Maguire and I, I sat on I sat on the High Performance Committee for, mm. committee for New Zealand Rugby League that we reinstated is he built a really good reputation. He's built the Kiwi jersey uh, and the, the need for those players to understand what it is to perform at that highest level. Uh, but that's some of the things. If you read into who the assistants are, uh, moving forward to the World Cup and after that, I think you will see some transition. So can, it's can a I transition. In that terms was a of great that. answer. <laughs> it's a, a transition from where we currently are because um, – Can't play. Yeah. But, yeah, okay. I think moving forward you'll see some – and not not only in the, the men's game but also the women's games too, you know, in terms of the coaching. Oh, I love it. We need. I love it. No, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, despite all the challenges you've had and, and the challenges that present themselves in the game that you're currently dealing with, it seems to me that we have a lot of challenges as Māori in our communities, and you're at the oh. vanguard of that in your community. Housing, uh, employment, uh, wages, uh, education. Now, you're working with that yep. right now. Exactly what are you doing to help your people at home? Yep. Very good question. So one of the things I currently chair, a, one of our economic development arms called Te Rua Waikato. So we are a cluster of 12 marae in the North Waikato. And what our main driver is, is around economic development. So and you touched specifically on some of the areas, employment, training, development, housing, are all those key indicators for us as Māori. So in specifically in our region, uh, we have contracts with MSD about employing and training our people, putting them into meaningful trades. We've just signed off a contract with uh, Māori Trade Training for the employment of 50 of our people within our rohe uh, in terms of into... Māori trade training and building, but also in agricultural uh, skills and services because a lot of our people love working on the land, getting them back into a lot of our young people into cropping, into farming, to dairying, sheep, beef, so all those sort of skills. So we've been able to negotiate with the government around upskilling and training our people for that. Uh, also, we have uh, have a relationship with Te Pukinga uh, in Waikato and we've been able to secure 15 scholarships for our Marae members from our rangatahi in that area to be upskilled to help them along with uh, the funding from Waikato Tiny for whenever else. So having those pathways, we're also looking at developing uh, relationships uh, with employers within our area. Sleepyhead is a big one, which is a big development in the Ohinuai area uh, where we've got employment, we've got housing, and we'll have, we've will have got people actually working in the Sleepyhead factory now. So when that factory opens next month, uh, sorry, next year, We'll already have some of our workers transitioning into the working and also 
the potential to have them having houses as part of that project. So there's a whole lot of different stuff. And most importantly, our, our Komatu, we were looking at developing our own uh, Māori retirement villages in terms of that, you know, in, in terms of uffing and looking after our old people because they fought the fight, yeah. you know, and they need to be looked after in their old age, you know, in, in communal uh, state-of-the-art, you know, facilities yeah. for them. So those are the things, you know, that I'm passionate about. And when I go back to my nana moro and the stuff that she says, this is what I'm doing. And that's what gives me, I suppose, the the ihi and the kaha to carry on to do what I'm doing. And it's not just an immediate need. Do you see no. this as being an ongoing, oh, it's an ongoing. growing is, need? No, it's an ongoing. It's for the next bloody two generations. You know what I mean? It's something that we want to build. We want to build the capability and capacity of our people to be able to be true tino ranga tiritang is self-determination yeah. and that's what this is all about we're not relying on anybody else we're developing it you know to have these uh, businesses to have these organizations to be self-fulfilling prophecy of you know we're in control of what we want to be doing can i ask you what have been the transferable skills from your life as a professional rugby league player that have served you well and doing what you're doing. So as chair of Tudu Waikato yeah. and in addressing some of the immediate needs that you're dealing with. At the Number moment. one thing for our people is being able to communicate, you know, being able to engage and connect with them at their level. So, you know, from football, learn that communication skill. As a leader, being able to communicate one-on-one, kanoi ki kanoi, and the wider group focus, being able to get a message across because everybody's different. See, so, so hey, I hear you say different. that, but that sounds to me like it's – if you've had the benefit and fortune of being brought up at home, particularly by the nannies, yeah. that uh, uh, I would have thought that came naturally anyway. Oh, it is. That that comes natural. It's a natural skill. Yeah. But then for a lot of our people, yeah, they do listen, but a lot of them don't listen and put that into action. That's the other piece in terms of that. So, you know, in, in, a, in a team environment, you've got to be able to take that information, disseminate it, and then put it into action in terms of that. So being a leader, being involved in teams, being communicating with coaches, senior players, the other players – because everybody's different in terms of that. You know, we all have different ways. People, some people you just need to have a wink. Some people you need to explain things 10 times before they do get it. Some need a slap, you know, some <laughs> some need to boot up the backside. You know, everyone's different and, and you've got to be able to be able to connect and engage with them. So one, comms is really, really important. Number one thing for, for any organisation, communication. Number two, probably having some empathy and, uh, you know, and understanding. Why is that important? I think it's really, really important because you don't really know what happens in people's homes. You don't really know what's happened to them. So having that understanding, being able to walk in their shoes, being able to understand them from their perspective, you know, having a different outlook sometimes, you know, because you know, people tend to, what's the word that I use, um, you know, classify everybody as the same. You know, you know and they aren't. You know, people have different upbringings. They've been through different challenges. They've been through different things in their lives that's impacted on them. So it's having some empathy and understanding. You know, so I can talk to the biggest CEOs of big companies, organisations, international companies, and then I can talk to the kazi at the marae. So being <laughs> able to communicate, engage, having some understanding of where they come from. You know, um, you know some of the in- some of the companies that we're dealing with in some of the solar farms. You've got billionaires from Europe, you've got billionaires you know, being able to engage and connect with those guys and talk around what's important for us as Māori and be able to connect with those guys is important. You do, know? Do, do you notice, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you notice when you walk in a room, because I notice it when you walk in a room, but you notice when you walk in a room, <clears throat> particularly guys from overseas, most of them are male, by the way. Yes. But do you notice when you walk in the room and they see you and they look at you and they go, well, it's the man. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 does that give you an ability to be able to leverage? Oh, 100%. That? I, I think, and, and that's another thing of being Māori and being confident in your tikanga and who you are. You know, you know, you can command that space, you can hold the room, you, you can talk to that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that, that is, you know, understanding who you are and where you come from. That's a big part of that, Julia. Okay. Do you know so what I mean? Communication, empathy, what else? The main, and the other one around that, the so three main things for me is being able to communicate, having some empathy and leading by example. That's the other one, you know, because all our whanau, all our people are like, yeah, they're whatever, their fella talks it up. But if you lead by example, you know, the fella's going to do that. He says he's going to do it and he does it. Because our people are very judgmental. 
<laughs> you know, they'll know for other fellas all, you know, Tinko or whatever it is, you know. So leading by example, you, you know, you've got to lead by example all the time. You know, everything that you're doing, people are watching you all the time. So, you know, if you say you're going to do something, you've got to, you know, get on and get it done. How and hard is that, though? That's really hard. Sometimes when you're reliant on other people, but, you know, one thing I've always learned in being in a team environment is surrounding yourself with good people. You know, if you've got good people and a good organisation and good structure, things seem to happen very quickly in terms of that stuff. So, you know, leading by example, that's always been something. And and, and the last one for me is just having a good support network, you know, surrounding yourself, whether it's family, whether it's business, whether it's, you know, sporting teams. Always surround yourself with people that you trust and you know that are there for the right reasons, you can't go wrong. You know, the fascinating thing about doing this kind of podcast is, you know, there's a saying that <clears throat> people say, don't meet your heroes. Um, my experience has always been the complete opposite because when I sit and talk with people like yourself who who were my heroes um, um, growing up and they're continue, continuing to do awesome things, there's a couple of things you notice straight away. Um, one is, um, no matter how fit I get, I'm never going to be as good as you. <laughs> um, um, number two, there seems to be a kind of internal force yeah. Yeah. that drives people like you. And it's continuing to drive you now and what you're doing with your mahi, particularly for the good of your community and your whanau. And then the other thing is, it's that last thing you mentioned about leading by example. And I don't know if you, you realise the kind of power you have in just – walking in a room and hanging out with people <laughs> and everyone kind of turns around and goes, oh, it's the man, you know. Um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, um, uh, you know, uh, there is an inspiration that and a motivation that people get off you. I don't know if you know that, but there's an inspiration, motivation, vigoration people get off you just by you being in a room. And that's powerful. Yeah, that is powerful. But, I, you know, I talked about those role models and stuff before now, matriarchs, but... You know, I always just wanted to be like my dad. Yeah. How um, did you ever get the opportunity to have the sit down with them and give them the opportunity to say just how proud of you they are? Yeah, you know, I did. I did. I remember after the grand final. Here's a good story. Um, my dad, my mum and dad came to the grand final. And we're having a beer in the changing sheds after after the game. My dad was down there, came down. And uh, John Howard, who was the Prime Minister <laughs> for Australia, comes over, he says, Tara Nikau, fantastic game today. Um, he was the number one badge holder for the St. George Dragons. He was their number one fan. He says, if you weren't playing today, we would have won the bloody game. And I turned around to my old man and I said, oh, Dad, it's not too bad. Not every day the Prime Minister comes <laughs> up and shakes your hand and says it wasn't for you. And the old man says... Yeah, not too bad, but remember that day when I left you in jail when you were 15 years old? <laughs> so the old man always had a bloody story, you know what I mean? In terms Is of that, that a true story? True story. True story, but we won't talk about it. <laughs> true but true story, that's what they said to the Prime Minister. And we had a beer with John Howard, my old man, but, you know, you know, my dad passed away a few years ago all of a sudden, but, you know, he was um, a great role model and someone that I miss. Mm, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and and certainly a better man than John Howard, who was an absolute prick. <laughs> it was the problem. <laughs> but yeah, you were spewing that we beat them that day in the grand final. Yeah. Good job. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm even. I'm even happier you won now. Look, I feel for Anthony Mundine. Yeah. You know, oh, oh what yeah, an athlete. But yeah, he was. Um, but you know, hearing the John Howard story makes me feel actually really good. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Tabata Thank welcome. you uh, for your time. May you continue to inspire us, and um, we wish you all the best with your mahi. Uh, kia ana te kore, mo te pani, mo te rama kore, da rera mahi a ngā mahi hai paunga mo te iwi. Uh, been a real privilege and honour and very humbling to come and spend some time with you, Julian. So thanks very much, and I'll give you the, the message for the code reunion when we have the new show. <laughs> right? I'm sure I won't be. Te nā koe, ha? Nā mihi ni te.